Hi, and welcome to today's webinar. Before we introduce the speaker, I just want to make a couple of brief announcements. We know many of you are listening in from far away and can't attend local events and programs, and that's why we provide this free webinar series. We do host multiple Simply visit our website at www.johnson-center.org and click on the webinars link on the right hand side. New webinars and events are often added, so if you're not on our email list, I encourage you to visit our website and click on the join our email list link that appears on the home page. We do have many great summer events coming up, including free family fun, sibling summer camps, social skills groups, and webinars. To get instant news and events from the Johnson Center, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as we do often announce grant and scholarship opportunities, research opportunities, and last-minute events and presentations there. For those of you who are local to Austin, be sure to check out our junior series, a free fun, free fun family event for all children ages 4 to 10. You can find information on our Facebook page and website, and the first event is this Saturday. Be sure to follow our colleagues at the Autism Research Institute as they host their own webinar initiative, and they do share some great resources on their website and social media pages. Now before we begin the presentation, please note that questions may be typed into your control panel throughout the presentation, and time permitting, they will be addressed during the presentation. Also, for those of you who have requested copies of the presentation, we don't send out presentation slides, but we do post recordings of all of our free webinars on the Johnson Center YouTube channel found at YouTube slash The Johnson Center, no spaces, and you can subscribe to get full access to all of our recorded webinars. If you would like a certificate of attendance after today's webinar, please look for a follow-up email that will come to your mailbox one hour after the webinar concludes. It will contain instructions and the link on how to download your certificate. Now please welcome today's presenter, Dr. Claire Shitty. Dr. Shitty is the staff psychologist here at the Johnson Center, and she brings her expertise, compassion, and understanding to all she does here, whether it's completing assessments and diagnostics, running social skills and sibling camps, and working on her research projects. Please welcome our presenter, Dr. Shetty. Hello everyone, thank you for joining me today. My name is Dr. Claire Schutte, and like the introduction mentioned, I'm a psychologist at the Johnson Center. And I'm looking forward to pre presenting today's webinar, Evaluation of Autism Spectrum Disorder in Adults. I'd like to start by reviewing the agenda for today's presentation. First, I'm gonna be discussing reasons for seeking an evaluation as an adult and the benefits that it can bring. I'll then move into a description of the diagnostic criteria and review of what should be included in an adult evaluation. And then I'm going to discuss some special issues related to adults and evaluations. If you are an adult and are interested in getting evaluated or know someone who is, my hope is that this information will give you a better understanding of the process, the benefits, and what to look for when seeking an evaluation. If you're a clinician, I hope that this presentation today gives you some helpful tools and understanding of what you should use and just some overview of best practices in evaluating adults. Many times when someone reaches adulthood um, and they think that they might meet criteria for a particular diagnosis, um, you think, why? Why at this point in my life should I seek an evaluation? Um, isn't it too late? Am I too old? Um, several common questions for adults thinking about seeking a diagnosis are, um, I've made it this far, what's the difference if I get a diagnosis or not? Or how can this help? Or is it worth it? Some common reasons for an individual getting a referral during adulthood for an ASD evaluation are things like um, sometimes having a child with autism spectrum disorder can make an adult parent think, hmm, um, could I have this as well? Also marital and family difficulties or lifelong social difficulties can lead to a referral or questions regarding a possible diagnosis. Um, treatment of certain psychiatric symptoms might not be sufficient, um, and it may be an underlying uh, ASD diagnosis. 
or sometimes loss of employment or difficulty with employment can lead to questions as well as um, getting information and understanding through the media about autism spectrum disorder. So why seek an evaluation for ASD? When I, when I say ASD, I'm referring to autism spectrum disorder, um, just to shorten it up a bit. So why seek an evaluation as an adult? Seeking an evaluation can be different for everyone. Um, some might be shocked or anxious, anxious about a potential diagnosis or a referral. Other people might feel that a diagnosis is the answer to their problems. And really, no matter what the final answer is, if an adult is struggling with issues related to ASD, an evaluation can help in many ways. And some of these are that it can validate um, struggles and difficulties that the individual has dealt with for years. It can provide answers as to why. Why have I been struggling with this? Um, and it can provide those answers. Sharing a diagnosis or evaluation results with others can increase others' understanding of difficulties. Importantly, it can help guide treatment and support for the individual. It can lead to personal growth, and it can help with access to helpful services. So that was a quick review of why evaluate. Now I'm going to discuss diagnostic criteria for ASD. Um, these next, this next section is going to be a bit technical, so bear with me, but I wanted to give a clear idea of what autism spectrum disorder is and the criteria that's needed for meeting a diagnosis. Autism spectrum disorder is a neurodevelopmental disorder that impacts social communication and behavior. As stated in the most updated diagnostic manual, the DSM-5, neurodevelopmental disorders are a group of conditions with onset in the developmental period. I want to highlight the term developmental period because this is important to remember when assessing adults. There has to be evidence of symptoms in early childhood to support a diagnosis as an adult. This can get tricky because it's harder to gain accurate history for adults. It's harder for them themselves to remember um, early childhood and it can sometimes be difficult to um, gather that information from loved ones, for example. Autism spectrum disorder is not a one-size-fits-all diagnosis. So everyone with the diagnosis is different in their own unique ways. Um, but they share a common set of symptoms, and these symptoms can vary across severity and presentation. And I like to refer to this as the spectrum, or a wide range of presentation. So these next um, Bullet points highlight what's actually in the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. The DSM is the primary manual that clinicians use to diagnose. So for an autism spectrum disorder, the first main category of symptoms is social communication and interaction is manifested by all of these areas, either currently or by history. Social emotional reciprocity. So the individual has to have symptoms or deficits with social emotional back and forth. This can be things like understanding and using emotions, uh, the use of empathy and perspective taking. Deficits in nonverbal communicative behaviors used for social interaction. This can refer to things like eye contact, facial expressions, social smiling and the use of eye gaze. And then third, deficits in developing, maintaining, and understanding relationships. So again, the individual must present with all three of these, currently or by history. The second main area of criteria, criteria deal with restrictive 
repetitive patterns of behaviors, interests, or activities, and there must be at least two of the following symptoms. Stereotyped or repetitive motor movements, speech, or objects. This can be things like repetitive tapping, odd or repetitive speech, and repetitive engagement with objects such as tapping, flicking, or stacking or insistence on sameness, or routines refers to inflexibility, compulsive type behavior, rigidity and rituals. Examples would be ritualized routines, having to do something just this way, or extreme trouble with change. Or highly restricted and fixated interests, these refer to interests that seem kind of obsessive and all-encompassing. Um, the interests must be abnormal in how intense they are or how focused they are, such as an obsessive interest in botany, certain musicians, etc. And then this last one here can be um, sensory-related behaviors and sensitivities. This can be um, an abnormal seeking out of sensory input or an abnormal sensitivity to sensory input. So things like um, sensitivity to noise, light, or textures. Um, an example might be not being able to wear certain textures of clothing, being overwhelmed by office lighting or noise. So again, to meet criteria, the individual has to have at least two out of four of these. And then a few other diagnostic criteria points are symptoms must be present in the early developmental period. Um, so there has to be evidence that the individual struggled during early development. However, they make a note here, um, they might not be fully manifest until social demands exceed limited capacities. So an example of this might be um, a lot of times when children enter elementary school, um, symptoms become more overt or more obvious because there are higher social demand in school. Um, so those social difficulties might become more apparent. Another point that they make in the DSM is that or these might be masked by learned strategies later in life. This is an important point for the evaluation of adults because a lot of times, and I'll discuss this later, um, through their lifetime, adults have struggled who have ASD and they've learned different compensatory and different strategies for managing their symptoms. So those might mask some of their underlying difficulties. For a diagnosis, symptoms must cause clinically significant impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. So there must be clin clinically significant issues um, that are really causing some, uh, um, some impairment. So it could be in relationships, such as in marriage or friendships, um, and work performance are some examples that adults are going to struggle with more. And then finally, these difficulties are not better explained by um, intellectual disability or global developmental delay. Another note that the DSM-5 makes is that individuals with a well-established DSM-4 diagnosis of autistic disorder, Asperger's disorder, or PDD-NOS should be given the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. And this brings me to um, the next few slides where I'm going to discuss um, a little bit about some of the diagnostic changes from the previous edition to the most updated edition of the DSM and some changes to these um, previous diagnostic labels. And I'll discuss that in a minute. But one more aspect of the diagnostic um, criteria in the DSM are the ratings of severity levels. So the diagnosis of ASD in the DSM is further differentiated by severity levels, and these indicate the amount of support that's needed 
in the areas of social communication and restricted and repetitive behaviors. So an individual, if they meet criteria for ASD, um, their diagnosis should also indicate um, the severity levels, and these are given in each symptom area, so they should get a severity level in the social affect area and a severity level in the restricted and repetitive behaviors area. So an example might say autism spectrum disorder level one social communication and level two restricted and repetitive behaviors. Level one is the least amount of support needed and three means substantial support. Um, so one is least severe, moving up to three is more severe or indicative of needing more support. As I mentioned, um, there were some significant changes in diagnostic criteria for autism um, between the previous edition of the DSM, the DSM-4, and the newest edition, the DSM-5. Many of you have likely heard of Asperger's disorder, PDD-NOS, and autistic disorder used as diagnoses. These were diagnoses that the previous edition, the fourth edition, had. With the DSM, the diagnosis shifted from these separate diagnoses to one umbrella term, autism spectrum disorder. So these three diagnoses no longer exist in the newest manual. It's only autism spectrum disorder. Older individuals who have been diagnosed with these in an earlier age don't just or shouldn't just lose their diagnosis. Um, as I mentioned in this previous slide here, let's see if I can go back, um, the DSM does make note that individuals with a well-established diagnosis of these um, should be given the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder if they're reevaluated. Now, um, if an adult is seeking an initial diagnostic evaluation, um, most likely the clinician is going to use the updated diagnostic criteria and the label autism spectrum disorder. I wanted to talk about um, Asperger's just for a little bit because I find that um, many times adults can relate more to the term Asperger's. Um, Asperger's disorder was oftentimes thought of as a higher functioning version of autism. Um, also, many individuals who have been diagnosed with Asperger's really connected with the label in the community of other individuals with Asperger's. Um, so there's been a variety of different opinions on the diagnostic changes to the DSM. Um, some individuals and adults who have been previously diagnosed with Asperger's might feel frustrated that the label is no longer. Um, other people might not mind as much and might see autism spectrum disorder as a more encompassing term. Um, but again, for individuals who have been previously diagnosed and are reevaluated, um, just because that criteria has changed, they shouldn't just lose their diagnosis. Um, and as a clinician, what I've done is I provide the new DSM-5 diagnosis of ASD, but I might make a descriptor, and I put a descriptor down there and say previously diagnosed with Asperger's. Um, just so that if the individual does still connect with that diagnostic label, um, I respect that in the report. Social communication disorder is a new diagnosis in the DSM-5 that describes persistent deficits in the use of social verbal and nonverbal communication as well as understanding of other people's use of speech. So this new diagnosis, it's similar to ASD, but it doesn't include the presence of restricted and repetitive behaviors. Um, so that's the main differentiating factor of social communication disorder. 
Um, social communication disorder is also listed under communication disorders and not as a neurodevelopmental disorder. So that's another big difference. Um, but for individuals who struggle mostly with just the aspects of social communication, um, this might be a potential diagnosis that they meet criteria for um, if they do have the absence of those restricted and repetitive behaviors and interests. Differential diagnosis is a term that refers to the process of figuring out which diagnosis fits and which ones don't. Um, so this is a process that the clinician goes through when evaluating an individual for um, any type of diagnosis. Some common diagnoses that are involved in the differential diagnosis of ASD are um, a variety of different anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, mood disorder, and personality disorders. Um, and differential diagnosis can vary greatly depending on what symptoms and difficulties the individual is presenting with. So there can obviously be other diagnoses that you're kind of ruling out depending on um, the primary symptoms that that individual is presenting with. So I've reviewed why seek an evaluation as an adult. We just covered the diagnostic criteria. I know, again, that was a little dry and technical, but I want to give you a clear idea of um, what the DSM-5 criteria is for meeting a diagnosis. And now I'm going to talk about an overview of the evaluation process for an adult eval for ASD and some different assessment options that are available. It's important that an adult seeking an evaluation finds a qualified clinician um, to complete the evaluation. Unfortunately, there aren't many clinicians who specialize particularly in evaluating adults. This is a relatively newer area. Um, so a good step, and what I recommend, is to call clinics that provide diagnoses and diagnostic evaluations for ASD in children and adolescents and ask if they evaluate or are willing to evaluate adults. Um, Autism Speaks has a helpful resource guide according to state. Um, so contacting autism specific clinics in your area can be a good place to start. Also um, asking if you are seeing a therapist, if they have a particular referral to someone who sees adults. Um, but kind of the pathway to diagnosis can be difficult for individuals as well. Um, many of them, as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, might be struggling in particular areas and that prompts them to seek an evaluation or oftentimes an individual might get a referral from their primary care doctor or from a psychologist or therapist. Uh, and also, many individuals might learn more about ASD and really identify with it and seek an evaluation that way. A diagnostic evaluation should include a thorough interview with the individual and relevant loved ones, an observation of the interview, testing and assessment, and a review of relevant records. And I'm going to talk in more specifics about these different areas. Adults that are seeking an evaluation for ASD are on the rise, and this is likely due to increased awareness and resources. Um, unfortunately, adult-specific assess assessments are lacking, but I've seen more being developed in recent years to meet this need. Um, so it's important that a good evaluation should include a very thorough diagnostic interview. This is a huge way of pulling information and gaining information um, since assessments and spe specific tests are somewhat lacking at this point. 
Um, during the clinical interview, this can be used as a time for the clinician to make informal assessments and observations such as the individual's body language, their eye contact, their conversational skills. Um, so the clinical interview or the diagnostic interview is really a key, key um, aspect of an adult evaluation. This is a very long list of areas to cover in a diagnostic interview for adults. Um, what I like to do is I actually integrate um, the autism diagnostic interview. This is a standardized diagnostic interview um, that's used for the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorders. Uh, it's not geared specifically towards adults, um, so I don't use it um, formally. However, I do use many of the early development questions and integrate those into my diagnostic interview. I also sometimes use it if I'm able to talk to a loved one or a caregiver um, about the individual's early childhood development. I also create my own um, document with all of these areas that I go through during the diagnostic interview and I make notes in these main areas on what the individual is reporting and what examples they provide. Um, the areas listed here are all important to cover. And an important point to remember is to get real life examples. For example, um, get examples, for example, that was a tongue twister. Um, if the individual reports trouble with conversation, Ask them if they can think of a time recently when they had trouble and describe it to you. Um, or if they report sensory sensitivities. Uh, get examples such as what are they sensitive to? How does it affect them? Um, so you really want to gather that uh, clear data from them and through the examples that they provide. I'm not going to go through all of these um, bulleted areas, um, but again, all of these are important, particularly um, in the areas of communication, uh, social affect, and then um, interests and behaviors. Um, and you're also going to want to touch on um, emotional issues because those can be relevant for adults. Um, and then all of the areas of um, early history that I have listed on here. Additional sources of information for adults um, can be obtained through informally probing conversation skills and social functioning and relationships. Um, so I recommend during the clinical interview um, and when you're talking with the individual to strike up conversation and see how it goes. Um, also, it can be beneficial to meet with a loved one, for example, a spouse, um, a close friend, a parent, and get information from them. Um, this is very important for helping gather some of that early developmental history as well. And then relevant records can also be useful or um, touching base with the individual's referring clinician. For example, if they're um, working with a therapist, talking with a therapist can be useful. Or uh, reviewing records of previous evaluations. Now I'm going to talk about some specific tests and assessments that are currently available for adults. Um, a more recently developed assessment, uh, the Social Responsiveness Scale has been out for a while, um, but they just published an adult form. Um, the Social Responsiveness Scale is more of a screening assessment that can help with the diagnosis of ASD. Um, the different scales that it helps measure are related to social awareness, social cognition or thinking, social communication, social motivation, as well as autistic mannerisms and behavior. It provides a total score that's compared to a cutoff, 
Um, if the individual meets this cutoff, it's suggestive of a possible autism spectrum disorder. Um, another use of the social responsiveness scale is as a measure of severity. Um, so it does provide kind of an indication of the level of symptoms as well. Um, and it's a self-report form for adults, so the adult completes it themselves. The adult Asperger's assessment is another available ses assessment. This one was published by Barron and Cohen in 2005. Um, it hasn't been actually published by any testing companies that I'm aware of, um, but it can be accessed online. Um, if you look up the assessment, uh, you can download the actual questionnaires um, just from online. It includes four sections um, that describe groups of symptoms that correspond um, to criteria for Asperger's. Now, one point about this assessment, and people might wonder about, is that um, it's called the adult Asperger's assessment, and with Asperger's not being currently included in the DSM-5 diagnostic manual, is this still relevant? And yes, it is. Um, even though the labels have changed, this assessment is still very helpful in gathering um, information to support a possible diagnosis. Um, so it includes, it's broken into relevant symptom areas that the clinician can use to kind of gather support of whether or not the individual is meeting symptoms in those relevant areas. Um, and it also includes two self-report questionnaires um, called the AQ and the EQ. The H AQ is called the Autism Spectrum Quotient. It consists of 50 items that measure things like social skills, attention, communication, and imagination. And then the Empathy Quotient is 60 items and relates more specifically to aspects of empathy. So the individual completes these two portions of the assessment. Um, in this box down here, um, this is just a quick little snapshot of some of the questions um, from the AQ. Um, and I'll read this out loud in case it's hard to see. Um, this is just an example. I prefer to do things with others rather than on my own. And then the individual answers according to the scale or I prefer to do things the same way over and over again. Um, another aspect of this assessment that I like is that um, in that initial portion where you're kind of gathering data in the four different areas related to autism, it actually indicates what items from these two assessments can support those areas. Um, another way that I like to use this um, is that I like to review the results after the individual has completed it and go over important ones with them and ask them if they can provide examples of um, some of the items or, you know, I might say, tell me more about um, your preference to do things with others rather than on your own or um, tell me more about your answer to, I prefer doing things the same way over and over again. Can you describe that? Can you give me some examples or how does that impact you? Many of you have likely heard of the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. Um, the ADOS-2 is considered a gold standard in the assessment of ASD. Um, many people view this as a tool for younger children, however, it was developed to be administered to all ages, including adults. Um, I find that depending on the age and functioning level of the adult, um, some of the activities of the ADOS can seem inappropriate for older, very higher functioning adults. Um, however, the upper module, um, including module four, this is kind of um, the upper level form that can be administered. This includes more interview type questions. Um, so even if you don't administer more of the interactive based activities for an adult, I do find that the module four 
um, interview style questions uh, can be very helpful helpful in supplementing the diagnostic interview. Um, and what makes the ADOS helpful is that it's really the only standardized observational measure for evaluating adults with ASD. Um, and that's what makes it a well-regarded test in general is that it's a standardized observational measure. Um, it's always helpful for diagnostic evaluations, particularly for autism, um, to include a variety of different types of assessments when at all possible, including directly administered standardized tests and things like questionnaires such as the social responsiveness scale or the adult Asperger's assessment. So it's really great if you can have both when you can. Um, but again, it's going to depend on um, kind of the functioning level and appropriateness of whether you're going to administer that. Um, there's some research out of the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston um, that's looking at the personality assessment inventory or the PAI profiles of adults with ASD. Um, preliminary results from their research has shown a pattern of elevations on the PAI, um, which suggests significant anxiety and depression. Um, and especially the cognitive and affective symptoms of these. And then additionally, it's common to see elevations on the schizophrenia scale of the PAI. Um, and with these results, it showed that um, withdraw and, and detachment, um, so these are more almost social related aspects and do make sense when we're thinking about ASD. But again, um, withdrawal and detachment aspects of the schizophrenia scale are more associated with ASD rather than the psychotic type symptoms associated with ASD. So this is important. Um, I see this as important uh, in two ways. For one, um, oftentimes personality assessments such as the PSI, P PAIs, excuse me, are given to adults in an adult evaluation. Um, if you're aware of these common profiles, it can help, you know, support a diagnosis of ASD. It can point to potential emotional and affective related symptoms, which are common due to the lifelong struggles that the individual has likely experienced. Um, and then Knowing this, if a schizophrenia scale is elevated and if this is common for individuals on the spectrum, understanding that it's more the withdraw and detachment aspects of this rather than psychotic symptoms, because um, that can provide kind of a slippery slope, um, especially with a clinician that's less familiar with autism, um, that elevated schizophrenia scale um, could lead to someone getting diagnosed with more of a psychotic disorder, for example. Um, so I think that this research is important and hopefully there will be more research in other more personality and emotional based um, questionnaires for adults. Another assessment that's available is um, the Adult Repetitive Behavior Questionnaire. Um, this was created out of the Wales Autism Research Center, um, a collaboration with them, Newcastle University, and the Olga Tennyson Autism Research Center in Australia. Um, this is a measure that's specific for restricted and repetitive behaviors. Um, so routines, rituals, repetitive motor movements, um, sensory interests, and repetitive actions with objects. Um, and it's the first published self-report questionnaire of repetitive behaviors in adults. Um, it's for adults who are 18 years of older, 18 years of age or older, um, and it has 20 questions and takes only about five minutes to complete. Um, it's not a diagnostic instrument, rather it just measures the symptom area. Um, and it's important to note that it's not specific to autism, so it can be used to measure these types of, re 
of behaviors and symptoms um, across different disorders or difficulties. Um, but if you are having trouble as a clinician ruling out an autism spectrum disorder and aren't quite sure if the individual has those restricted and repetitive behaviors necessary for a diagnosis, this might be a helpful assessment to pull in um, to gather some additional data in that area. Depending on the assessment need or question or what the individual is presenting with, some additional areas that might be assessed might be IQ or cognitive abilities. Um, some tests that can measure this are the Weschler scales of intelligence or if the individual has um, is nonverbal or has trouble with their verbal abilities. The lighter is a good measure um, for IQ and cognitive functioning. Learning and achievement tests can be assessed with a, um, assessments such as the Woodcock-Johnson. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these assessments just for the sake of time, but I do want to highlight just some additional areas um, that might need to be assessed, such as adaptive functioning, behavioral and emotional functioning, executive functioning, as well as neuropsychological type um, functioning. And this could be things like attention, working memory. Additionally, many adults with ASD might have co-occurring conditions. Um, and this is common. A lot of times adults have really struggled and had trouble their entire life. So it's expected that there might be some level of um, anxiety or mood-related symptoms. So it's important to see if the individual might meet additional criteria um, for a mood or anxiety disorder. Um, and there might be others depending on what the individual is presenting with and they should be assessed, diagnosed, and treated. The evaluation of adults comes with some unique challenges, and I want to go over this. Um, it can be difficult to obtain early developmental history. Um, you know, even most of us have trouble knowing and remembering our early developmental history. Um, individuals might not have or feel comfortable with you interviewing a loved one or a friend. Um, however, this information is oftentimes needed. Most adults have developed some, some level of compensating strategies or um, kind of masking strategies that might cover up some of their symptoms. So it can make it difficult if they have developed some um, good social skills despite it being very challenging. Females oftentimes present differently than males. Um, such as having more compensatory strategies and kind of blending in better. This can make it difficult to observe symptoms of ASD. And then finally, co-occurring or comorbid conditions can make a diagnosis trickier to make. Another challenge uh, with adult evaluations is managing evaluation expectations. It can help to discuss the individual's expectations regarding the evaluation from the start, um, such as asking what are their concerns about the evaluation, why are they seeking an evaluation. Um, if they express that they're hoping or expecting to obtain an ASD diagnosis, it can help to talk through in the beginning how they might feel if results don't support it, or if results are unclear or point to a different diagnosis. Um, additionally, discussing the benefits of evaluations outside of the diagnostic label can help, such as getting answers, guiding treatment, gaining support. Um, with the increased awareness of ASD, I found that the label of um, ASD or Asperger's 
has become an adjective at times and more and more people find that they can relate to many aspects of the diagnosis. Um, and this has driven more people to seek a diagnostic evaluation. Um, just with any evaluation, it can sometimes lead to disappointment when the, individu when the individual doesn't meet a diagnosis. Um, from a, accounts from some patients I've worked with, the disappointment can be due to things like, if it's not autism, then what's wrong with me, or why do I struggle in these areas, or I already connect so much to people who have autism and what it means. And this can be hard, and it can be hard to work through for the patient. So it's important that as a clinician, you process these feelings and thoughts during the feedback appointment. And then on the flip side, clients can be disappointed and understandably overwhelmed by receiving the diagnosis. Um, again, it's important to process these feelings and to guide them in seeking further information and support um, in moving forward with the results. I found that um, for adults in particular, it's beneficial to use a therapeutic assessment model. Um, it's important to review the findings and the diagnosis as well as to process their feelings regarding it um, and to use this information to instill positive change. The feedback appointment is also when support services should be discussed such as a support group, counseling or specialized services such as job, job coaching or ABA therapy. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the therapeutic assessment model, look up Stephen Finn, F-I-N-N, -N, and he's the one who created the model. Um, but it's more just, uh, I would say, client-based assessment model um, and involves processing the feelings related to the process and the results. One of the biggest benefits of evaluation, um, in addition to getting answers about a potential diagnosis, are the recommendations. These should provide the adult guidance and kind of a blueprint on how and where they can get support in areas that they need it, such as individual counseling, finding a support group, um, support and connecting with peer groups, things like job coaching or social support, stress management, managing any anxiety or mood issues. Um, I do want to make a note that our YouTube channel has a lot of helpful webinars on adult issues um, such as transitions and college supports. If you are looking for that, um, see our YouTube channel. And then for those of you that are clinicians and are either working with adults or are interested in doing so, um, the evaluation of adults for ASD is a relatively new area and there isn't much published literature or guidelines on the topic, so it's even more important um, if you do evaluate adults that you gather as much training and research as possible and consult as needed. Also, it's critical to be thorough and to use multiple data sources when making your conclusions. So again, as we've talked about today, you want to use observation, specific assessment tools, the diagnostic interview, interview with family and loved ones, and to use a therapeutic feedback model um, and provide beneficial treatment and support guidance. Uh, before we wrap up today, I'd like to share a personal account of a female adult who received a diagnosis. I found this um, from NPR. It was an article called, When an Autism Diagnosis Comes in Adulthood. Um, if you're interested, I, I do recommend reading this article. Um, I really enjoyed reading the accounts from the individuals that were highlighted. So this one that I'm going to read is from Emily Page. She's a 33-year-old stage manager in New York. I probably first heard the word autism when I was about 10, watching Rain Man on television one afternoon. But I first started taking seriously that I might actually be autistic and not just broken when I was 21 or 22. And in the course of research on another topic, I happened across some writing by the autistic writer Amanda Bags. I had always had a lot of trouble 
that other people didn't seem to have. Things felt like they were always hard for me and easy for everyone else. I spoke late and speaking was never easy. I had a lot of sensory issues, issues with food, clothing, noise, light, and touch. I had a lot of motor planning issues that made basically everything hard. Problems I had in school I can now trace back to undiagnosed auditory processing problems. These are common in autistic people. I went from always feeling like I was on the social periphery to being invisible to being badly bullied. It was like I was blind and deaf to things that were socially obvious to others, like I was never actually speaking the same language, and it left me just feeling really irreparably alone. When I started reading the work of autistic people, they were describing things about my life accurately for the first time. Eventually, the state of being of both knowing and not knowing, of feeling split into two different versions of myself was too much. I cut myself off from a lot of my own authenticity in the course of just trying to survive, and it became torture. So I asked my doctor for a referral to someone who could assess an adult for autism. After receiving the diagnosis, I was elated. I was so relieved. I felt vindicated. So much of my life had always been such a mystery, but I had a real answer now. I also had something in common with one of my best friends. I dropped by a Starbucks for coffee. I had to help finish a, a show loadout, so I walked down to the theater since it was a pretty day. I went home, made dinner, and bought a, bought a bottle of wine to celebrate. So that was just one personal account from Emily Page. This was, again, from the NPR article, When an Autism Diagnosis Comes in Adulthood. Um, everyone's experience with the diagnostic process is going to be different, um, but for many it can bring a lot of personal validation and almost relief in some ways, like, ah, this is the reason why I've struggled for this long. Um, but again, for some people it can be much harder to di digest. So it's important if you are seeking an evaluation as an adult um, to think about what it means for you. Um, and if you're a, a clinician diagnosing adults, to be sensitive to the different experiences that people are coming in with. Um, again, for further information and resources, please visit our YouTube channel. We have a lot of very great webinars on relevant topics. And we've been adding more and more on adult and transition related issues. You can also follow us on the Johnson Center um, Facebook and Twitter pages. Um, and again, one hour or so after the webinar concludes, you'll get a brief quiz and a certificate of attendance. And it looks like we have a few minutes for questions, so I'd like to take some time to review those. Okay, there's some good questions here. Are there any differences in diagnosis for adult women and men? There aren't. The criteria that need to be met are actually the same across um, ages and gender. Um, when I reviewed the diagnostic criteria earlier, um, those are the criteria for everyone that need to be met. However, as I mentioned, sometimes um, women and men or girls and boys can present a little bit differently and research has suggested that um, females have more kind of masking or when I say masking it's kind of strategies that they've developed to blend in more um, than males so that's important for clinicians to be aware of when they are eva evaluating females in, in general. This ne next question asks, what should an individual do if they feel as though they have been misdiagnosed with something other than ASD? Um, I would recommend seeking a second opinion um, or getting a secondary evaluation if you are able to. Um, this is true for any diagnosis or even in the medical field. It can be helpful to get a second opinion if you feel that it's just not quite right or maybe the clinician wasn't thorough in their evaluation and you feel that um, you could get a more thorough one. Um, so yes, I do suggest getting a second opinion or a second evaluation if you're able to. 
um, if you feel that it doesn't fit you. Um, let's see, this next question asks, where can I find support groups for adults with ASD? Um, these are going to vary across location. Um, I would suggest that if you're in college, look into your college and see many colleges do offer different support groups, some specific to ASD or for students that might have some social struggles. Um, I've seen many support groups through meetup.com, so I would recommend searching in your area under meetup.com and see if there are any specifically for ASD. Um, and then looking through different support guides, uh, Autism Speaks, for example, has um, a guide per state on resources um, and contacting local autism-focused clinics and asking if they provide any supports for adults, and if not, if they have any referrals for those. Let's see, it looks like we have time for one more question. Um, I recently got diagnosed, should I tell my workplace? That's a good question, and the answer is going to depend on your individual situation. Um, in many cases, disclosing your diagnosis can help facilitate the working relationship and open the door to further support and understanding. However, this is really going to depend on your comfort level as well as your workplace. Um, so I suggest weighing the pros and cons of disclosing, and there's also things that you can discuss um, with your workplace without disclosing the specific diagnostic label. Um, so you can talk about issues with your working conditions, for example, um, talking about how you have some sensory related sensitivities and you would really benefit from some lower lighting or um, noise canceling headphones or communicating with your boss for example how you communicate best so um, maybe saying I really communicate best through email and it's easier for me to get my point across would you mind if we um, use that form of communication um, for these types of tasks and those are just some examples Thank you everyone for tuning in today. I hope that you found um, this presentation and webinar helpful. Um, I appreciate your time and attention. And it looks like it's time to wrap it up. Have a great afternoon.